So uh, this whole story that I'm really excited to present tonight because I've been like basically accosting people in bars about it for the last mm, month came because I was reading a self-help book called The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. And this story was in it. Well, a, like a really truncated, not so accurate version of this story. So here we go. It is 1974, so to give you some context, the Whalers have just broken up in a fairly messy breakup, and Bob Marley has launched his solo career. Barbara Streisand is topping the charts with The Way We Were, <laughs> and Watergate has basically just exploded. Nixon has become the first, hopefully not the last, president to resign, <laughs> and the US is pretty like, oh fuck. And polyester is king. Um, in, in more serious tones, despite the fact that the US has pulled out of Vietnam, the Vietnam War is actually still going and is rounding out its time. Uh, also, MASH is now playing in its second year, which is about a war that had already ended. Uh, all this time, and did this actually? Is it doing it? Okay. Uh, this is my super high tech, look at what I did. No, go back. Okay, so all this time, there is a man in a small island, that island, still fighting World War II. Wait, what? No, seriously. Animations are hard, no, go back. Okay, so, um, no, seriously, so Hiro Odono, was declared dead in 1959. We're nowhere near 1959, we're decades after that. And, uh, but he kept pillaging villages with his men and burning crops and stealing cattle and as a consequence fighting with the police. And now it's 1974 and the last of his troops are dead and he's still fighting the war. That has been ended for a really long time. Meanwhile, back in Japan, there is this hippie kid, self-proclaimed explorer, but let's get real, he was just a hippie kid who had kind of rich parents, and so he had money, and so he was exploring the world. And he had decided to go out and find Hiro, a panda, and the abominable snowman. No one took him seriously. I mean, would you? He was looking for the abominable snowman. And his plan to find Hiro, not the snowman, was brilliantly simple. He was going to go to the island, and he was going to wander through the jungle yelling his name. Hiro! Hiro! Yeah, that was, that was his plan. Any wonder why no one thought he was real? So he drops himself off in this island, and he is there, a young hippie kid, uh, and he is hunting a trained killer who has escaped the police and the military for 30 years, simply by yelling his name. That's his plan. After four days, it fucking worked! <laughs> Stupid plans work. <laughs> and later, Hiro would say this, this hippie boy, Suzuki, came to the island to listen to the feelings of a Japanese soldier. He asked me why I wouldn't go home. I said, if the war is over and I receive an order telling me to stop fighting, I would come out. He doesn't believe the war is over. Seriously, doesn't believe so. So let's take a step back and try to get into the head of a man who has been fighting a 30-year war and understand why he doesn't believe the war is over. So in December of 1944, Hiro, who is 22 years old and an intelligence officer, very highly trained, and many other men, men are dropped off onto this island. And they are given an order to lay siege to this island by way of guerrilla warfare to never surrender, to never kill themselves, and to continue to fight or survive off the land for as long as they have to. Um, let's be clear, December 
1944, the war didn't look good for the Japanese. They just sent a whole bunch of really young men to an island and told them to never surrender and to never kill themselves, which is the socially acceptable way out. They were on a suicide mission in which suicide was not a possibility. So Otona and his men waged guerrilla warfare and they cut off food supplies and they killed cows and they killed men and they waged siege warfare in a guerrilla fashion to this island. Um, but three months later, the Allied forces show up and take the island and in fact take the Philippines and kill and capture nearly all of the men that were there. The surviving group retreat to the hills and they begin to ration food and bullets and make a plan. They're going to live off of very, very rationed rice, so small amounts of rice. They are going to eat coconuts, which any Californian will tell you is the cure-all for everything. <laughs> and they're gonna steal cows when they need to and they're gonna continue on with their mission. August 6th, the first bomb drops on Hiroshima. August 9th, the second bomb drops on Nagasaki. August 15th, Japan surrenders. And August, uh, September 2nd, formal documents are drawn up ending Japanese involvement in the war. But Otono and his men don't know this, or perhaps they don't believe this, and they continue to hide in the jungle and carry out their orders. And the locals, frankly, are fucking sick of it. Their cows are being killed, they're getting killed, their fields are being burned, and their supplies are destroyed. And let's face it, they have been part of a war that fucking sucked. And they're like, dude, the war is over, go the fuck home. But these men continue to do this. And so this is when the first leaflets fall from the sky. And I'd like you to imagine you're on an island, hiding in the jungle, eating coconut and rice and a little bit of cow meat when you can get it. And there are leaflets falling from the sky that say the war ended in August 1945, come out of the jungle. Would you believe it? Would you believe it? if your entire existence was wrapped up in the idea that you would never surrender? The men didn't. They thought it was a ploy. They thought it was the enemy coming to them and trying to draw them out. They would not surrender and they continued to move forward. They knew that if the war truly was over, that their commanding officer would fly in and tell them. So for months and then years and then decades, these men survived in the jungle. They rationed their food supplies, they escaped from the police, and they ignored all signs that the war was over. And these signs were many. There was no Japanese soldiers on the island. There was no, in fact, really military on the island. There was police. There was huge cultural shifts on this island that happen after a war. And leaflets were dropping from the motherfucking sky. It wasn't just once. They kept doing this. They kept trying to convince these men to come out but they would never abandon their mission, never. But one by one, the men were killed by police, by farmers. One of them wandered off and later surrendered. And in December 14th, 1972, 28 years later, the last of Otono's men died. They had come out of the jungle to burn a rice field, still carrying out their original order to lay siege to this island by guerrilla warfare, by cutting off the supplies and starving the people out. And a policeman saw them, shot, and Kozaka died. Okuno escaped back into the jungle, and there he was, alone with his thoughts, and alone with his 28-year mission. But it turns out, funny this, that when a soldier that was long thought dead dies, it hits the news and fairly fast and comes back to Japan. And this is where Norio uh, Suzuki heard of Otono for the first time. And then he sent out on his mission to find Hiro, a panda, and the abominable snowman <laughs> in that order. And even though Suzuki did find Otono and became quite good friends with him during the time that he spent on the island, Otono still did not believe that the war was over and he refused 
to surrender. After 30 years, his sole self-worth, his entire belief system was wrapped up in the fact that this war was happening, that his mission was important to his emperor and his culture, a culture that he loved very much. And he refused to go back to Japan. He wanted his superior offer to come to him. Luckily, his superior officer was wasn't dead, long since retired. And so he came to the island, he returned, and gave these orders. The orders to stand down. The truth that the war was over. And this is what Hiro wrote in his autobiography of that moment. For the first time, I realized there was no subterfuge. This was no trick. Everything that I had heard was real. There was no secret message. The pack became heavier still. We really lost the war. How could we have been so sloppy? Suddenly everything went black. A storm of rage was inside of me. I felt like a fool. Worse than that, what had I been doing for all of these years? He surrendered. He surrendered his rifle that still worked. Yeah, your shoes fall apart. <laughs> rifle still going, he still maintained it. The bullets he still had that he had rationed and stolen. And finally, his sword in a formal ceremony to the president of the Philippines, who pardoned him for his considerable post-war <laughs> crimes. Let's not Hero worship, Hiro. He killed 30 people after the war was done. He burned countless fields. He made people starve. This was not a man who was doing amazing, heartfelt things and hiding in the jungle. He was still waging war. And so he surrendered. But at home in Japan, they were looking for a hero or a hero and found Hiro. He was welcomed back with open arms. He was given a massive pension, which he refused. He was very popular. <laughs> but this, this isn't his Japan. Imagine stepping back 30 years and then coming today in one day. Imagine the horror you would feel in all of that technological advancement but for, you can just squeeze the juice back. <laughs> and here he is in this Japan that he doesn't remember, in this Japan that he didn't fight for, in this Japan that doesn't have the same culture, that doesn't have the same pride. And he would say later in his autobiography, once you have burned your tongue on hot soup, you blow on even cold sushi. And this is how the Japanese government behaved toward the US and other nations. He was hugely disenchanted. And even though he was a hero at home, he was miserable. After fighting this war for 30 years that was already over long before, he had returned to a country that simply was not his. So he retired. He retired to Brazil to be a cattle rancher, to escape this modern world in a simpler world. He later became a survival instructor teaching skills because clearly he had them. <laughs> and he is still considered a hero. And when he passed, there was news stories everywhere. Later in life, he would tell reporters, I became an officer, I received an order. If I could not carry it out, I would feel shame. I am very competitive. <laughs> hero passed away only a few years ago in 2014 at the age of 91. And today I would like to raise a glass to survival, to competitiveness, and to hero.